Chapter One of Totem and Taboo. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Totem and Taboo by Sigmund Freud. Chapter One: The Savage's Dread of Incest. Primitive man is known to us by the stages of development through which he has passed, that is, through the inanimate monuments and implements which he has left behind for us, through our knowledge of his art, his religion, and his attitude towards life, which we have received either directly or through the mediums of legends, myths, and fairy tales, and through the remnants of his ways of thinking that survive in our own manners and customs. Moreover, in a certain sense, he is still our contemporary there are people whom we still consider more closely related to primitive man than to ourselves in whom we therefore recognize the direct descendants and representatives of earlier man we can thus judge the so-called savage and semi-savage races their psychic life assumes a peculiar interest for us for we can recognize in their psychic life a well-preserved early stage of our own development if this assumption is correct, a comparison of the psychology of primitive races, as taught by folklore, with the psychology of the neurotic, as it has become known through psychoanalysis, will reveal numerous points of correspondence and throw new light on subjects that are more or less familiar to us. For outer, as well as for inner reasons, I am choosing for this comparison those tribes which have been described by ethnographists as being most backward and wretched, the aborigines of the youngest continent, namely Australia, whose fauna has also preserved for us so much that is archaic and no longer to be found elsewhere. The aborigines of Australia are looked upon as a peculiar race, which shows neither physical nor linguistic relationship with its nearest neighbors, the Melanesian, Polynesian, and Malayan races. They do not build houses or permanent huts. They do not cultivate the soil or keep any domestic animals except dogs, and they do not even know the art of pottery. They live exclusively on the flesh of all sorts of animals which they kill in the chase and on the roots which they dig. Kings or chieftains are unknown among them, and all communal affairs are decided by the elders in assembly. It is quite doubtful whether they evince any traces of religion in the form of worship of higher beings. The tribes living in the interior who have to contend with the greatest vicissitudes of life owing to a scarcity of water seem in every way more primitive than those who live near the coast. We surely would not expect that these poor naked cannibals should be moral in their sex life according to our ideas, or that they should have imposed a high degree of restriction upon their sexual impulses. And yet we learn that they have considered it their duty to exercise the most searching care and the most painful rigor in guarding against incestuous sexual relations. In fact, their whole social organization seems to serve this object, or to have been brought into relation with its attainment. Among the Australians, the system of totemism takes the place of all religious and social institutions. Australian tribes are divided into small sets, or clans, each taking the name of its totem. Now what is a totem? As a rule, it is an animal, either edible and harmless, or dangerous and feared. Most rarely the totem is a plant, or a force of nature, rain or water, which stands in a peculiar relation to the whole clan. The totem is first of all the tribal ancestor of the clan, as well as its tutelary spirit and protector. It sends oracles, and though otherwise dangerous, the totem knows and spares its children. The members of a totem are therefore under a sacred obligation not to kill, destroy their totem, to abstain from eating its meat or from any other enjoyment of it. Any violation of these prohibitions is automatically punished. The character of a totem is inherent not only in a single animal or a single being, but in all the members of the species. From time to time, festivals are held at which the members of a totem represent or imitate in ceremonial dances the movements and characteristics of their totem. The totem is hereditary either through the maternal or the paternal line. Maternal transmission probably always preceded and was only later supplanted by the paternal. The attachment to a totem is the foundation of all social obligations of an Australian. It extends on the one hand beyond the tribal relationship, 
and on the other hand it supersedes consanguineous relationships. The totem is not limited to district or locality. The members of a totem may live separated from one another and on friendly terms with adherents of other totems. Footnote. This very brief extract of the totemic system cannot be left without some elucidation and without discussing its limitations. The name totem or totem was first learned from the North American Indians by the Englishman J. Long in 1791. The subject has gradually acquired great scientific interest and has called forth a copious literature. I refer especially to Totemism and Exogamy by J. G. Fraser, four volumes, 1910, and the books and articles of Andrew Lang, for example, The Secret of Totem, 1905. The credit for having recognized the significance of totemism for the ancient history of man belongs to the Scotchman J. Ferguson MacLennan. Exterior to Australia, totemic institutions were found and are still observed among North American Indians, as well as among the races of the Polynesian island group, in East India and in a large part of Africa. Many traces and survivals otherwise hard to interpret lead to the conclusion that totemism also once existed among the aboriginal Aryan and Semitic races of Europe so that many investigators are inclined to recognize in totemism a necessary phase of human development through which every race has passed. How then did prehistoric man come to acquire a totem? That is, how did he come to make his descent from this or that animal foundation of his social duties, and as we shall hear of his sexual restrictions as well? Many different theories have been advanced to explain this, a review of which the reader may find in Wundt's Volker Psychology, Volume 2, Mythos und Religion. I promise soon to make the problem of totemism a subject of special study in which an effort will be made to solve it by applying the psychoanalytic method. Not only is the theory of totemism controversial, but the very facts concerning it are hardly to be expressed in such general statements as were attempted above. There is hardly an assertion to which one would not have to add exceptions and contradictions, but it must not be forgotten that even the most primitive and conservative races are in a certain sense old, and have a long period behind them during which whatever was aboriginal with them has undergone much development and distortion. Thus among those races who still evince it, we find totemism today in the most manifold states of decay and disintegration. We observe that fragments of it have passed over to other social and religious institutions, or it may exist in fixed forms but far removed from its original nature. The difficulty then consists in the fact that it is not altogether easy to decide what in the actual conditions is to be taken as a faithful copy of the significant past and what is to be considered as a secondary distortion of it. End footnote. And now, finally, we must consider that peculiarity of the totemic system which attracts the interest of the psychoanalyst. Almost everywhere the totem prevails, there also exists the law that the members of the same totem are not allowed to enter into sexual relations with each other, that is, that they cannot marry each other. This represents the exogamy which is associated with totem. This sternly maintained prohibition is very remarkable. There is nothing to account for it in anything that we have hitherto learned from the conception of the totem or from any of its attributes. That is, we do not understand how it happened to enter the system of totemism. We are therefore not astonished if some investigators simply assume that at first exogamy, both as to its origin and to its meaning, have nothing to do with totemism, but that it was added to it at some time without any deeper association when marriage restrictions proved necessary. However that may be, the association of totemism and exogamy exists and proves to be very strong. Let us elucidate the meaning of this prohibition through further discussion. A. The violation of the prohibition is not left to what is, so to speak, an automatic punishment, as is the case with other violations prohibitions of the totem, for example, not to kill the totem animal, but is most energetically avenged by the whole tribe, as if it were a question of warding off a danger that threatens the community as a whole, or a guilt that weighs upon all. 
a few sentences from fraser's book will show how seriously such trespasses are treated by these savages who according to our standard are otherwise very immoral Quote, in australia the regular penalty for sexual intercourse with a person of a forbidden clan is death it matters not whether the woman is of the same local group or has been captured in war from another tribe a man of the wrong clan who uses her as his wife is hunted down and killed by his clansmen and so is the woman though in some cases if they succeed in eluding capture for a certain time the offense may be condoned in the tata thai tribe new south wales in the rare cases which occur the man is killed but the woman is only beaten or speared or both till she is nearly dead the reason given for not actually killing her being that she was probably coerced even in casual amours the clan prohibitions are strictly observed any violations of these prohibitions are regarded with the utmost abhorrence and are punished by death unquote. b as the same severe punishment is also meted out for temporary love affairs which have not resulted in childbirth the assumption of other motives perhaps of a practical nature becomes improbable c as the totem is hereditary and is not changed by marriage the results of the prohibition for instance in the case of maternal heredity are easily perceived if for example the man belongs to a clan with the totem of the kangaroo and marries a woman of the emu totem the children both boys and girls are all emu according to the totem law incestuous relations with his mother and sister who are emu like himself are therefore made impossible for a son of this marriage footnote but the father who is a kangaroo is free at least under this prohibition to commit incest with his daughters who are emu in the case of a paternal inheritance of the totem the father would be kangaroo as well as his children then incest with the daughter would be forbidden to the father and incest with the mother would be left open to the son these consequences of the totem prohibition seem to indicate that the maternal inheritance is older than the paternal one for there are grounds for assuming that the totem prohibitions are directed first of all against the incestuous desires of the son and footnote d but we need only a reminder to realize that the exogamy connected with the totem accomplishes more that is aims at more than the prevention of incest with the mother or sisters it also makes it impossible for the man to have sexual union with all the women of his own group with a number of females therefore who are not consanguinously related to him by treating all these women like blood relations the psychological justification for this extraordinary restriction which far exceeds anything comparable to it among civilized races is not at first evident all we seem to understand is that the role of the totem the animal as ancestor is taken very seriously everybody descended from the same totem is consanguinous that is of one family and in this family the most distant grades of relationship are recognized as an absolute obstacle to sexual union thus these savages reveal to us an unusually high grade of incest dread or incest sensitiveness combined with the peculiarity which we do not very well understand of substituting the totem relationship for the real blood relationship but we must not exaggerate this contradiction too much and let us bear in mind that the totem prohibitions include real incest as a special case in what manner the substitution of the totem group for the actual family has come about remains a riddle the solution of which is perhaps bound up in the explanation of the totem itself of course it must be remembered that with a certain freedom of sexual intercourse extending beyond the limitations of matrimony the blood relationship and with it also the prevention of incest becomes so uncertain that we cannot dispense with some other basis for the prohibition it is therefore not superfluous to note that the customs of australians recognize social conditions and festive occasions at which the exclusive conjugal right of a man to a woman is violated the linguistic custom of these tribes as well as most totem races reveals a peculiarity which undoubtedly is pertinent in this connection for the designations of relationship of which they make use do not take into consideration the relation between two individuals but between an individual and his group 
They belong, according to the expression of L. H. Morgan, to the classifying system. That means that a man calls not only his begetter father, but also every other man who, according to the tribal regulations, might have married his mother and thus become his father. He calls mother not only the woman who bore him, but also every other woman who might have become his mother without violation of the tribal laws. He calls brothers and sisters not only the children of his real parents, but also the children of all the persons named who stand in the parental group relation with him, and so on. The kinship names which two Australians give each other do not therefore necessarily point to a blood relationship between them, as they would have to according to the custom of our language. They signify much more the social than the physical relations. An approach to this classifying system is perhaps to be found in our nursery, when the child is induced to greet every male and female friend of the parents as uncle and aunt. Or it may be found, in a transferred sense, when we speak of brothers in Apollo or sisters in Christ. The explanation of this linguistic custom, which seems so strange to us, is simple if looked upon as a remnant and indication of those marriage institutions which the Rev. L. Fison has called group marriage, characterized by a number of men exercising conjugal rights over a number of women. The children of this group marriage would then rightly look upon each other as brothers and sisters, although not born of the same mother, and would take all the men of the group for their fathers. Although a number of authors, as for instance B. Westermark in his History of Human Marriage, oppose the conclusions which others have drawn from the existence of group relationship names, the best authorities on the Australian savages are agreed that the classificatory relationship names must be considered as survivals from the period of group marriages and according to Spencer and Gillen in the Native Tribes of Central Australia, 1899, a certain form of group marriage can be established as still existing today among the tribes of the Urubuna and the Dieri. Group marriage, therefore, preceded individual marriage among these races and did not disappear without leaving distinct traces in language and custom. But if we replace individual marriage, we can then grasp the apparent excess of cases of incest shunning which we have met among these same races. The totem exogamy, or prohibition of sexual intercourse between members of the same clan, seemed the most appropriate means for the prevention of group incest, and this totem exogamy then became fixed and long survived its original motivation. Although we believe that we understand the motives of the marriage restrictions among the Australian savages, we have still to learn that the actual conditions reveal a still more bewildering complication. For there are only few tribes in Australia which show no other prohibition besides the totem barrier. Most of them are so organized that they fall into two divisions which have been called marriage classes or fratries. Each of these marriage groups is exogamous and includes a majority of totem groups. Usually each marriage group is again divided into two subclasses, subfratries, and the whole tribe is therefore divided into four classes the subclasses thus standing between the fratries and the totem groups. The typical and often very intricate scheme of organization of an Australian tribe therefore looks as follows. This is a description of the illustration that is within the text here. There are three levels to the illustration. The first level is labeled fratries and has two divisions, small letter A and small letter B. Stemming from A are two elements, small letter C and small letter D. From small b extend two elements, letter E and letter F. C, D, E, and F are labeled subfratries. From each of C, D, E, and F, three further subcategories. From C, alpha, beta, and gamma. From D, delta, epsilon, and eta from E, 1, 2, and 3, from F, 4, 5, and 6. These last 12 are labeled totem. There is a dotted arcing line running from C to E and another from D to F. End description of the illustration.
The twelve totem groups are brought under four subclasses and two main classes. All the divisions are exogamous. The subclass C forms an exogamous union with E, and the subclass D with F. The success or the tendency of these arrangements is quite obvious. They serve as a further restriction on the marriage choice and on sexual freedom. If there were only these twelve totem groups, assuming the same number of people in each group, every member of a group would have eleven twelfths of all the women of the tribe to choose from. The existence of the two fratries reduces this number to six twelfths or one half. A man of the totem alpha can only marry a woman from the groups one to six. With the introduction of the two subclasses, the selection sinks to three twelfths or one fourth. A man of the totem alpha must limit his marriage choice to the women of the totems four, five, or six. The historical relations of the marriage classes, of which there are found as many as eight in some tribes, are quite unexplained. We only see that these arrangements seek to attain the same object as the totem exogamy, and even strive for more. But whereas the totem exogamy makes the impression of a sacred statute, which sprang into existence no one knows how, and is therefore a custom, the complicated institutions of the marriage classes, with their subdivisions and the conditions attached to them, seem to spring from legislation with a definite aim in view. They have perhaps taken up afresh the task of incest prohibition, because the influence of the totem was on the wane. And while the totem system is, as we know, the basis of all other social obligations and moral restrictions of the tribe, the importance of the fratries generally ceases when the regulation of the marriage choice at which they aimed has been accomplished. In the further development of the classification of the marriage system, there seems to be a tendency to go beyond the prevention of natural and group incest and to prohibit marriage between more distant group relations in a manner similar to the Catholic Church, which extended the marriage prohibitions always in force for brothers and sisters to cousins and invented for them the grades of spiritual kinship. It would hardly serve our purpose to go into the extraordinarily intricate and unsettled discussion concerning the origin and significance of the marriage classes, or to go more deeply into their relation to totemism. It is sufficient for our purposes to point out the great care expended by the Australians, as well as by other savage people, to prevent incest. We must say that these savages are even more sensitive to incest than we, perhaps because they are more subject to temptations than we are, and hence require more extensive protection against them. But the incest dread of these races does not content itself with the creation of the institutions described, which in the main seem to be directed against group incest. We must add a series of customs which watch over the individual behavior to near relatives in our sense, which are maintained with almost religious severity, and of whose object there can hardly be any doubt. These customs, or custom prohibitions, may be called avoidances. They spread far beyond the Australian totem races, but here again I must ask the reader to be content with a fragmentary excerpt from the abundant material. Such restrictive prohibitions are directed in Melanesia against the relations of boys with their mothers and sisters. Thus, for instance, on Leper's Island, one of the New Hebrides, the boy leaves his maternal home at a fixed age and moves to the clubhouse, where he then regularly sleeps and takes his meals. He may still visit his home to ask for food, but if his sister is at home, he must go away before he has eaten. If no sister is about, he may sit down to eat near the door. If brother and sister meet by chance in the open, she must run away or turn aside and conceal herself. If the boy recognizes certain footprints in the sand as his sister's, he is not to follow them, nor is she to follow his. He will not even mention her name and will guard against using any current word if it forms part of her name. This avoidance, which begins with the ceremony of puberty, is strictly observed for life. The reserve between mother and son increases with age and generally is more obligatory on the mother's side. If she brings him something to eat, she does not give it to him herself, but puts it down before him. Nor does she address him in the familiar manner of mother and son, but uses the formal address. 
similar customs attain in new caledonia if brother and sister meet she flees into the bush and he passes by without turning his head toward her on the gazella peninsula in new britain a sister beginning with her marriage may no longer speak with her brother nor does she utter his name but designates him by means of a circumlocution in new mecklenburg some cousins are subject to such restrictions which also apply to brothers and sisters they may neither approach each other shake hands nor give each other presents though they may talk to each other at a distance of several paces the penalty for incest with a sister is death through hanging these rules of avoidance are especially severe in the fiji islands where they concern not only consanguineous sisters but group sisters as well to hear that these savages hold sacred orgies in which persons of just these forbidden degrees of kinship seek sexual union would seem still more peculiar to us if we did not prefer to make use of this contradiction to explain the prohibition instead of being astonished at it among the batas of sumatra these laws of avoidance affect all near relationships for instance it would be most offensive for a batan to accompany his own sister to an evening party a brother will feel most uncomfortable in the company of his sister even when other persons are also present if either comes into the house the other prefers to leave nor will a father remain alone in the house with his daughter any more than the mother with her son the dutch missionary who reported these customs added that unfortunately he had to consider them well founded it is assumed without question by these races that a man and a woman left alone together will indulge in the most extreme intimacy and as they expect all kinds of punishments and evil consequences from their consanguineous intercourse they do quite right to avoid all temptations by means of such prohibitions among the barangos in delagoa bay in africa the most rigorous precautions are directed curiously enough against the sister-in-law the wife of the brother of one's own wife if a man meets this person who is so dangerous to him he carefully avoids her he does not dare to eat out of the same dish with her he speaks only timidly to her does not dare to enter her hut and greets her only with a trembling voice among the akamba or wakamba in british east africa a law of avoidance is in force which one would have expected to encounter more frequently a girl must carefully avoid her own father between the time of her puberty and her marriage she hides herself if she meets him on the street and never attempts to sit down next to him behaving in this way right up to her engagement but after her marriage no further obstacle is put in the way of social intercourse with her father the most widespread and strictest avoidance which is perhaps the most interesting one for civilized races is that which restricts the social relations between a man and his mother-in-law it is quite general in australia but it is also in force among the melanesian polynesian and negro races of africa as far as the traces of totemism and group relationship reach and probably further still among some of these races similar prohibitions exist against the harmless social intercourse of a wife with her father-in-law but these are by far not so constant or so serious in a few cases both parents-in-law become objects of avoidance as we are less interested in the ethnographic dissemination than in the substance and the purpose of the mother-in-law avoidance i will here also limit myself to a few examples on the banks island these prohibitions are very severe and painfully exact a man will avoid the proximity of his mother-in-law as she avoids his if they meet by chance on a path the woman steps aside and turns her back until he is passed or he does the same in vanna lava or port patterson a man will not even walk behind his mother-in-law along the beach until the rising tide has washed away the trace of her footsteps but they may talk to each other at a certain distance it is quite out of the question that he should ever pronounce the name of his mother-in-law or she his on the solomon islands beginning with his marriage a man must neither see nor speak with his mother-in-law if he meets her he acts as if he did not know her and runs away as fast as he can in order to hide himself among the zulu kaffirs custom demands that a man should be ashamed of his mother-in-law and that he should do everything to avoid her company he does not enter a hut in which she is and when they meet he or she goes aside she perhaps hiding behind a bush while he holds his shield before his face 
they cannot avoid each other and the woman has nothing with which to cover herself, she at least binds a bunch of grass around her head in order to satisfy the ceremonial requirements. Communication between them must either be made through a third person or else they may shout at each other at a considerable distance if they have some barrier between them as, for instance, the enclosure of a crawl. Neither may utter the other's name. Among the Basogas, a Negro tribe living in the region of the Nile sources, a man may talk to his mother-in-law only if she is in another room of the house and is not visible to him. Moreover, this race abominates incest to such an extent as not to let it go unpunished even among domestic animals. Whereas all observers have interpreted the purpose and meaning of the avoidances between near relatives as protective measures against incest, different interpretations have been given for those prohibitions which concern the relationship with the mother-in-law. It was quite incomprehensible why all these races should manifest such great fear of temptation on the part of the man for an elderly woman old enough to be his mother. The same objection was also raised against the conception of Faison, who called attention to the fact that certain marriage class systems show a gap in that they make marriage between a man and his mother-in-law theoretically not impossible, and that a special guarantee was therefore necessary to guard against this possibility. Sir J. Lubbock, in his book The Origin of Civilization, traces back the behavior of the mother-in-law toward the son-in-law to the former marriage by capture. Quote, as long as the capture of women actually took place, the indignation of the parents was probably serious enough. When nothing but symbols of this form of marriage survived, the indignation of the parents was also symbolized, and thus custom continued after its origin had been forgotten. End quote. Crawley has found it easy to show how little this tentative explanation agrees with the details of actual observation. E. B. Tyler thinks that the treatment of the son-in-law on the part of the mother-in-law is nothing more than a form of cutting on the part of the woman's family. The man counts as a stranger, and this continues until the first child is born. But even if no account is taken of cases in which this last condition does not remove the prohibition, this explanation is subject to the objection that it does not throw any light on the custom dealing with the relation between mother-in-law and son-in-law, thus overlooking the sexual factor, and that it does not take into account the almost sacred loathing which finds expression in the laws of avoidance. A Zulu woman who was asked about basis for this prohibition showed great delicacy of feeling in her answer, quote, it is not right that he should see the breasts which nursed his wife, end quote. It is known that also among civilized races, the relation of son-in-law and mother-in-law belongs to one of the most difficult sides of family organization. Although laws of avoidance no longer exist in the society of the white races of Europe and America, much quarreling and displeasure would often be avoided if they did exist and did not have to be re-established by individuals. Many a European would see an act of high wisdom in the laws of avoidance which savage races have established to preclude any understanding between two persons who have become so closely related. There is hardly any doubt that there is something in the psychological situation of mother-in-law and son-in-law which furthers hostilities between them and renders living together difficult. The fact that the witticisms of the civilized races show such a preference for this very mother-in-law theme seems to me to point to the fact that the emotional relations between mother-in-law and son-in-law are controlled by components which stand in sharp contrast to each other. I mean that the relationship is really ambivalent, that is, it is composed of conflicting feelings of tenderness and hostility. A certain part of these feelings is evident. The mother-in-law is unwilling to give up the possession of her daughter. She distrusts the stranger to whom her daughter has been delivered, and shows a tendency to maintain the dominating position to which she became accustomed at home. On the part of the man, there is the determination not to subject himself any longer to any foreign will, his jealousy of all persons who preceded him in the possession of his wife's tenderness, and last but not least, his aversion to being disturbed in his illusion of sexual overvaluation. 
as a rule such a disturbance emanates for the most part from his mother-in-law who reminds him of her daughter through so many common traits but who lacks all the charm of youth such as beauty and that psychic spontaneity which makes his wife precious to him the knowledge of hidden psychic feelings which psychoanalytic investigation of individuals has given us makes it possible to add other motives to the above where the psychosexual needs of the woman are to be satisfied in marriage and family life there is always the danger of dissatisfaction through the premature termination of the conjugal relation and the monotony of the wife's emotional life the aging mother protects herself against this by living through the lives of her children by identifying herself with them and making their emotional experiences her own parents are said to remain young with their children and this is in fact one of the most valuable psychic benefits which parents derive from their children childlessness thus eliminates one of the best means to endure necessary resignation imposed upon the individual through marriage this emotional identification with the daughter may easily go so far with the mother that she falls in love with the man her daughter loves which leads in extreme cases to severe forms of neurotic ailments on account of the violent psychic resistance against this emotional predisposition at all events the tendency to such infatuation is very frequent with the mother in law and either this infatuation itself or the tendency opposed to it joins the conflict of contending forces in the psyche of the mother in law very often it is just this harsh and sadistic component of the love emotion which is turned against the son-in-law in order better to suppress the forbidden tender feelings the relation of the husband to his mother-in-law is complicated through similar feelings which however spring from other sources the path of object selection has normally led him to his love object through the image of his mother and perhaps of his sister in consequence of the incest barriers his preference for these two beloved persons of his childhood has been deflected and he is then able to find their image in strange objects he now sees the mother-in-law taking the place of his own mother and of his sister's mother and there develops a tendency to return to the primitive selection against which everything in him resists his incest dread demands that he should not be reminded of the genealogy of his love selection the actuality of his mother-in-law whom he had not known all his life like his mother so that her picture can be preserved unchanged in his unconscious facilitates this rejection an added mixture of irritability and animosity in his feelings leads us to suspect that the mother-in-law actually represents an incest temptation for the son-in-law just as it not infrequently happens that a man falls in love with his subsequent mother-in-law before his inclination is transferred to her daughter i see no objection to the assumption that it is just this incestuous factor of the relationship which motivates the avoidance between son and mother-in-law among savages among the explanations for the avoidances which these primitive races observe so strictly we would therefore give preference to the opinion originally expressed by fison who sees nothing in these regulations but a protection against possible incest this would also hold good for all the other avoidances between those related by blood or by marriage there is only one difference namely in the first case the incest is direct so that the purpose of the prevention might be conscious in the other case which includes the mother-in-law relation the incest would be a fantasy temptation brought about by unconscious intermediary links we have had little opportunity in this exposition to show that the facts of folk psychology can be seen in a new light through the application of the psychoanalytic point of view for the incest dread of savages has long been known as such and is in need of no further interpretation what we can add to the further appreciation of incest dread is the statement that it is a subtle infantile trait and is in striking agreement with the psychic life of the neurotic psychoanalysis has taught us that the first object selection of the boy is of an incestuous nature and that it is directed to the forbidden objects the mother and the sister psychoanalysis has taught us also the methods through which the maturing individual frees himself from these incestuous attractions the neurotic however regularly presents to us a piece of psychic infantilism he has either not been able to free himself from the childlike conditions of psychosexuality or else he has returned to them inhibited development and regression 
Hence, the incestuous fixations of the libido still play, or again are playing, the main role in his unconscious psychic life. We have gone so far as to declare that the relation to the parents instigated by incestuous longings is the central complex of the neurosis. This discovery of the significance of incest for the neurosis naturally meets with the most general incredulity on the part of the grown-up normal man. A similar rejection will also meet the researches of Otto Rank, which show in even larger scope to what extent the incest theme stands in the center of poetical interest and how it forms the material of poetry in countless variations and distortions. We are forced to believe that such a rejection is above all the product of man's deep aversion to his former incest wishes, which have since succumbed to repression. It is therefore of importance to us to be able to show that man's incest wishes, which later are destined to become unconscious, are still felt to be dangerous by savage races who consider them worthy of the most severe defensive measures. End of chapter 1 Read by Mary Schneider